Good morning. I received a call on Erev Shabbos from a friend in the Columbus area. He's involved in building a mikveh. And since he's a Lubavitcher, of course, he's going to build it according to the specifications of the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, who was best friends with the great Goin and Tzaddik, Reb Chaim Brisker, Reb Chaim Salavechik. Those who knew the Rebbe Rashab, including my road, Reb Zaman Shimon Dworkin, testified that he was not only a tzaddik, but he was a goin elam. He was one of the greatest geniuses of his time. His son, the previous Rebbe, gave testimony that when he would discuss halachic matters with the great prodigy, Rabbi Yosef Rosen, known as the Ragachover, it was very difficult for the Ragachover to answer him. He, he struggled to answer him. Once the Rebbe Rashab then explained these concepts according to the inward element of Torah, which is Chesidus, Nagatshova said he, he couldn't follow. He had received a blessing only for the revealed part of the Torah from the Tzemach Tzedek. The, he, the secret part of the Torah was not his field and he could not comment. Not that he didn't want to, but he couldn't. He studied Hasidus, he studied the, the teachings of the Balatanya and his successor, uh, because he was, um, he was one of the Hasidim who came from Chabad Hasid, but who wasn't Lubavitch. And uh, so the Ragachover found it difficult answering the queries of the Rebbe Rashab once it got into the esoteric, uh, as great as the Ragachova was, he was lost. Which gives you an inkling of the greatness of the Rebbe Rashab. The Rebbe Rashab established his mikveh. Nobody ever made any kind of question as to the kashras of the mikveh. So the question is, what has happened since the Rebbe Rashab established his mikveh, oh, about a hundred years ago, in the city of Rastov, before he died. For those not familiar with the discussion, so I'm going to explain some concepts. Most mikvehs have as their place of immersion city waters. The city waters are called Mayim Shuvim, drawn waters, which according to all Torah authorities are not kosher for a mikveh. The only question is whether this is a Torah restriction or whether this is rabbinic. The Torah only talks about mikveh, Mayim, a gathering of water. And the rabbis say this is only a natural gathering of water where there hasn't been in the, in the involvement of the gathering, the hand of man. And therefore, you turn on the faucet and you have to take city water. The city water has been pumped from other areas. And therefore, the hand of man has been involved in this whole process, purifying it, uh, gathering it, pumping it. Then, then the, your, your actions in opening up the faucet create what is called Mayim Shuvim, or gathered waters. Therefore, it's not kosher for a mikveh. That's the bottom line. What is kosher for a mikveh is water that has gathered naturally, either from a spring that is underground, or rainwater that has been trapped naturally. Well, how do you trap it naturally? That's already up to experts how they get the rainwater to come into a gathering, which is called a bayr or a mikveh, and then what they do is they attach the uh, place where you have the sitting water with the rainwater through a hole. The hole has got to be at least two fingers wide. It's called kishvuferes hanoid, and they um, 
And when you have a connection that's as wide as Shfuferas Hanoi, two fingers, that makes the city water and the rainwater as one, and the city water becomes kosher for a mikvah. That's the general accepted way in which people do this. The problem that the Rebbe had was when you have two bodies of water, one next to the other, and people are entering it, there becomes an interplay between it. There's a technical term which is called nosan sov and notal sov. You put in a certain amount of water into the rainwater and you took it back because you have the natural ebb and flow. And if you have less than a certain measure of rainwater, original rainwater in this um, section where the rainwater was gathered, so then it's not really kosher according to many opinions. Some, most opinions say that it's once kosher and is already kosher. There are many opinions that say if the original rainwater has been lost, if there is less than a majority of rainwater, or if there's not a, another opinion, if there's not a complete 40 measures, 40 so of rainwater in the rainwater um, pit, original water, it's been replaced by some city water, that's called, that's not kosher. So every mikveh up until recently had this problem of interflow between one side and the other side. So there were many different methods of trying to avoid this problem of nosan shov and notal shov, the interplay between drawn water and gathered water, and the gathered rainwater. All of the methods that were discussed and presented had detractors and had serious halachic question, uh, including the, the method that the Chazon Ish uh, tried and uh, presented in, in, uh, in B'nai Brak, all of those methods had possible questions in Halacha that ultimately there would not be 40 measures of rainwater in the mikveh if you have Two, two mikvahs side by side, one rainwater where you don't immerse in, one city water where you do immerse in, there'll be an interaction between them. There won't be 40 measures after a while. And so the, 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 all of the great authorities try different ways of answering this problem to no avail. Essentially what had to happen was you had to gather uh, 40 measures of rainwater, it's about 100 gallons anywhere between 80 and 200 gallons, depending upon the size of the, uh, what you determine the size of the, of, of the measure to be. And when we're dealing with mikvahs, we usually take the most strict side. So we, we have at least to have, we at least have to have 200 gallons of rainwater in order for the mikvah to be kosher. So the, um, the Rebbe Rashab came up with an unusual idea it is known that cold water stays on the bottom and warm water stays on the top. So water that was put into a pit on the bottom would be cold. The water that was brought in from the city would automatically be heated. Heated water would stay on top and there would be little interaction. When the Rebbe first presented this, there was no one who questioned this, and this was the method that he promoted in order to avoid this problem of no san sov and not al So fast forward, there are other people who had uh, some questions. I won't talk about those questions. We'll talk about the main issue of what is the problem with a Lubavitcher mikveh, um, and the answer is nothing. It's all hyped up, and it comes from a hatred of Lubavitch. And because of this hatred of Lubavitch, 
people are willing to spend time to denigrate, to say Loshon Hore, to make up things, uh, because when you hate someone, and of course, the people who hate Lubavitch aren't Torah, aren't are Torah scholars, so therefore a Torah scholar just can't hate someone for no reason. You have to make something up that makes sense. So what happens is it becomes what is known as a fruma yitzhora, a yitzhora that puts on a silk bekasha with a streimel and payas and a beard, and says, "I'm holy, and you have to listen to me because I am an authority. I'm a Talmud Chochem, and you're not, and you have to therefore accept my opinion. Uh, and I tell you that this is a question. I'll give you, for instance, there was a fellow here." no longer is in our community, so I, if it ever gets back to him, uh, I'm not a problem, it's not a problem. But he quoted the Belzer Rebbe that when you have people going into the mikvah on top, they're going to come in with dirty feet and the mud will come into the bottom mikvah and will take up most of the mikvah. First of all, it's been denied that the Belzer Rebbe said it. That's number one. Number two, he was talking about a different time where people came in from uh, places where there was a lot of dirt and a lot of uh, filth and there was a lot of stuff on their, uh, people's feet. And it could be that, the, that there might have been an issue of mud a hundred years ago. Today, people shower before they go to a mikveh uh, they don't go barefoot into mud, nor do they have holes in their shoes that are going to get muddy and get, get their feet muddy. Uh, it's not the same kind of circumstance. So I told that so-called scholar, he may have 160, 170 IQ, I don't care, but he's not a scholar. I saw Rabbi Silverberg's mikveh, which is the Rebbe Rashab's mikveh, when he had to clean it out from the rainwater, and he asked me to look at it, to observe, to make it, make sure that it was kosher. The mikveh had been in business for about 16 years, and people used it on a regular basis. There was some dirt on the bottom, no question, there was some dirt, about one millimeter. The height of the down, uh, the mikveh down on the bottom was close to three feet. If you project a millimeter, three feet is approximately 90, 91, 92 millimeters. If in the course of 16 years you had um, one millimeter, and it wasn't even all the way, all across the mikveh, it would take approximately 600 years for there to be a shayla. Because Rabbi Silverberg's mikveh had far in excess of the 200 gallons according to the highest amounts. And also you have to know that, that, that uh, mud which, which is pourable. So it'd have to be really thick mud, but it would have taken anywhere between 600 and 1,000 years to make a shayla. Had he never cleaned it for 600 years? The man who I confronted with this, he says, I don't know what you saw. I, mean, I saw it with my own eyes. I'm going to lie to you. Yeah, we can open it up right now. It's visible. We can open it up. It's not, so it's called a Milsa David Ligluye. So it's something that I can demonstrate. And it's easily demonstrable if, we, if we're willing to, to do it for the couple of days, if that's, that's what's going to take to, for him to believe that. But he wasn't interested in truth. He hated Lubavitch, and therefore he had to make stuff up. But he's no longer in town. But there are still people in this town that said some very despicable things. 
they quoted Rav Shmuel Vosna, known as the Shevet HaLevi, that he had said that they're Shilas with the Mikveh. Since I have a Mechutin who's close, who has a son who is very close to the Shevet HaLevi, this, this goes back 15 years or so, before he was Nifter, so I sent a letter to the Shevet HaLevi asking him if he truly opposed a Mikveh al Gabi Mikveh, explaining to him that there were people who were making problems in this community. And he sent me a note, a handwritten note, right before Tisha B'Av. You have to understand, he was a great man, one of the greatest halachic authorities of our generation. When he saw that a Jew asked him a question about his position, that this might be, that his position might be used for supporting an argument, a machloikis, against the Rebbe Hashem Zemikveh, the Shevet HaLevi sent me a letter before Tisha B'Av saying, God forbid to say that I question a mikveh that was made by one of the G'dayli Yisrael of the previous generation. But again, truth does not make a difference. The person who mentioned it continued his battle against the Rebbe Rashab's mikveh. So what is the basis for those who really want to make a tumult, make a claim against the Rebbe Rashab's mikveh? There was none during the period of time when the Rebbe Rashab was alive. Only recently, only during this Rebbe, our Rebbe's lifetime, when he became Rebbe, did anybody mention a Shaila. Who was the person? It was a person known as the Helmet Zerov, who wrote a series of Svarim, I think 18 Svarim, called Taras Mahim on the Wars of Mikveh. And he promoted himself as the greatest authority in Mikvahs. For some reason, he decided he was going to start up with the Rebbe Rashab's Mikveh and declared that there was a Shaila of what is called Katafras. Now, for those of you who don't know what Katafras is, I'll explain. Katafras means an incline. When water goes down a mountain, that's called a Katafras. Water goes down an incline, the water does not stay in one place. And therefore, since it does not stay in one place, it's not gathered water. Um, it's not considered something that can connect one place to another. That's what the Gemara says. The Gemara says, a katafras, a, a, um, an incline, between one mikveh and another is not a chibur, is not a connection. You can't connect one thing that is flowing to the other using a kataphras. So what does it have to do with the side of a mountain with water flowing on it and creating waterfalls and so on and so forth. What does it have to do with the mikveh? So the answer is that in the 19th century, in the middle of the 19th century, there were women who were afraid to go to mikveh because the mikvois were basically cold, connected to a spring, a well that had to be dug deeply. And in order to go, down, go to the mikveh, you had to go down several flights of stairs in a largely unlit building. And the water was cold. They had to, it was, it was not like mikvahs today where you had showers, everything was done beforehand. They tried to make sure that they had nothing, they, that, that they had um, not contracted any kind of dirt while they were walking to the mikveh. And they went into the mikveh, into these very cold and low basement areas where you had to go down several flights of stairs 
It was cold and dark and scary. So the Kalasharov decided that he wanted to make a mikveh straight up from the street. He was going to make a mikveh with a shower, with, with, a, with a heater, but how is he going to get the water that makes the mikveh kosher? So he came up with an idea that he would connect the top mikveh with the bottom mikveh, with the, with the water of the, of the well, through a pipe. By connecting the water through a pipe, that would serve as a connection. The pipe was quite wide, and the connection was greater than two fingers, and he thought that this would be a good mikveh. Most of the poskim, the vast majority of the poskim, agreed with him. <coughs> Water that gathers on the ground goes through many fissures. Some of them are horizontal, some of them are vertical. So if you have a pool of water up here and there's a vertical drop and it goes down to another pool of water, what should be the problem? It's, it's water. It's water that's gathered and connected. But there was a great Hasidic Sharov, his name is, he was known as Reb Chaim Halberstam, known as the Sons of Rov, who wrote a sefer, Divrei Chaim. And the Divrei Chaim held that water connected from one mikveh to another mikveh vis-a-vis a pipe is very much like water connected to an incline on a mountain. Never mind that the water in the incline of the mountain is moving, but the the uh, the Sanzarov, the Sanzareva decided that it doesn't make a difference whether the water is moving or collected, or not moving, as long as it's not a usual way of gathering water. That's a catapris. Now, you all understand that water in a pipe, that if you have a, a glass jar, two glass jars that are connected by a, gla by, a, by a glass pipe, you fuse them together, and you pour water down, they're gonna be, doesn't make a difference, how big the two jars are and, and small the, the pipe is, they're going to be connected and they're not going to move. And so why should this not be considered a gathering, a mikveh? Well, the Divrichaim was insistent. Anything that was unusual, he called it tachbula. And if he got rid of the tachbula, it would go all over the place. It's not a connection. It was more of an emotional argument than a logical argument because it's very, very difficult. It's very difficult to back up with the different chayim logically. And there were those who tried, but it's very, very hard to explain. But the different chayim was one of the greatest authorities of his time, and because of that, the Kalashirov, despite his misgivings, despite the fact that. Most of the authorities of his time supported him. Never built that big. So along comes the Helvitzer and says, well, what difference does it make if the pipe is 30 feet or 40 feet as it was in college, or if it's three inches? And since it doesn't make a difference, the height of the pipe, since you have a top mikvah and a bottom mikvah connected by a an opening in a, in a floor, that's a pipe, and that's a catapris. First of all, you have to support the concept of the catapris, according to the Chaim, that it means an that it means not the water, but it means the incline. Secondly, how does the incline become a pipe? Thirdly, here it's not a pipe; it's a hole in a floor. The hole is a hand breadth square. 
which halachically has great significance. It's not just two fingers, but the difference between two fingers and a hand's breadth is when you have a connection that's a hand's breadth, it is not that they're touching each other and having contact with each other, but rather because there's a hand's breadth in between, there's an interaction between them. And they're considered as one. That's number one. So it's not a pipe. It's a hand's breadth opening. And it isn't any different than a hand's breadth opening in an underground canyon. When you have these big pools in the caves, where you see the stalactic, what do they call it, caves, you see water coming in different bodies, lakes, underground lakes, in these caves, they come from holes that are small. And if you have a, a contact with the hole, and there's a, there's a body of water on top and body of water on the bottom, what difference does it make? The fact that it's a narrow opening. But certainly if it's a hand's breadth opening, and that's not like a pipe, that's natural. That's a natural connection. And they consider it as one. The other thing you have to know is, is that when we make a Rebbe Rashav's mikveh, we don't have the floor. We fill up the mikveh with rainwater. And then when the rainwater covers a couple, a few inches above where the regular mikveh is, we then put in the, the floor. And we also combine city water with the rainwater, which is called zriya in a way that, according to most poskim, it already becomes like rainwater when it's been entered. So for the reasons that I have elucidated, for those who need a halachic explanation, I'm going to, I would have to go ahead and explain it more technically than I wish to do now. But actually, the, rain, the, the, the water that comes in from the outside goes directly into the rainwater that's on top of the flooring and and becomes commingled with it and it also um, it, it, it goes into the area which an area which is open and is commingled with the rainwater when regular water is commingled with rainwater most post can, most opinions say uh, it becomes like rainwater so the, 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 the city waters become like rainwater. The separation is not a pipe. It's really a, a, a floor that has holes that are, two holes that are hand breadth size. And there's no pipe in between. It's not considered a pipe. It's considered an intermingling. It's not just touching. And it has nothing to do with the question of the, the Sanzerov has nothing to do with the concept of katafras. To go back to the critics, the, the, the person who criticized the Rebbe Rashab's mikveh using the words of the, the holy Shevet HaLevi. The Shevet HaLevi quoted someone who was about Tshuva, who knew a little bit of chemistry and knew about water City water in B'nai Brak is very hard water. Rainwater doesn't have minerals. And so the objection of the Balchuva to the Rebbe Rishav's Mikta in B'nai Brak was that the city water would eventually come down because it was heavier than the rainwater on the bottom. And he made certain experiments and he showed it to the Rav Wozner and Rav Wozner therefore said they should put salt into the rainwater and that way they would make the rainwater heavier and there wouldn't be this interaction. Not wanting to um, create any shyness anywhere for there's a big Falgabi Mikveh, I did a little bit of research and I discovered that there is a table that tells you the specific gravity of hard water, water that has minerals in it, 
hard water doesn't only exist in the Nabrock. Hard water exists in Farmington Hills and in Oakland County and in most of the counties in America. Hard water has a certain specific gravity. Then I wanted to find out what the specific gravity of warm water, warm being about 98 degrees, which is, the, which is body temperature, which mikvah water that's warmed is above 98 degrees, because it has to feel warm to the touch, and therefore it would have to be about 98 degrees. And then I wanted to know what the specific gravity of water that was put into a pit. Now remember, mikvahs are usually found in basements or underground subterranean. And I want to know what the temperature of subterranean water usually is at a certain height, because water becomes very cold underground. For some reason it does. And I found out the average water temperature. And lo and behold, when you have cold water, even if the cold water is rainwater, pure water, its specific gravity is higher than mineral water when the mineral water is heated. I proved that. So even without the suggestion of the holy Sheva Talahifi, the water in the Nebrak in the Lubavitcher Mikvi is 100% kosher because cold water has a higher specific gravity than warm water. Enough of a difference to offset the higher specific gravity of water that has minerals. Another point I want to make, that I made in that discussion, is that I'm not certain that hard water comes in as a molecule, uh, except for things that are soluble, such as salt, the, the molecules of hard water are separate from the water. It's what's called a suspension. It's not, it's not a solution. Solution is when things dissolve and become actually chemically one with each other, with the water that's there. Um, there are many impurities in water which you see or don't see. So if you can see it, if it's, re if it's red iron, you can see the impurities. Those are not uh, mixed with water per se. Those are, that's mixture, so they're not in solution. Which means, if it's not in solution, it's not really a chemical, a single chemical with water. That's very important. So the, uh, the, the iron molecule and the calcium molecule and the copper molecule that's found in hard water is not part of the water molecule. So when they go down, they're very heavy. When they go down into the lower mikvah, they're not drawing the water molecule with it. They're only going themselves. And so the argument of the Bauchuva that the hard water will go down and the, and the rainwater will go up is not completely true. It is the molecule of the calcium, the molecule of the, of the iron and copper that will go down, but not the water itself. But even if you're going to argue that that would happen, that only happens when the water temperatures are the same. The water on the bottom, which is the May um, Shomim, is much colder and therefore is, has a higher specific gravity, enough of a difference to offset the greater specific gravity of the heavy water, which is called mineral water of May here. And so with all of that, I wish to dispel the myth that there are halachic issues with the Rebbe Rashab's mikveh. If you want to know um, more details halachically about this, there's a book called 
May Mikveh written by Rabbi Yirmiya Katz. He has a whole section in the Chelek Aleph, the first original printing where he defends the Rebbe Hashem's Mikveh. And in fact, up until recently, most of the Mikvehs that he built in Russia and elsewhere, he built like the Rebbe Hashem. So there is no Shaila. Whoever makes a Shaila is either an Amoritz or a Russia. He's either ignorant or he's evil. And I give you the choice of all those legacies.